Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a fairly short lecture again. And we just have one more chapter to do, chapter 39, uh, to cover all the material for exam three. And so uh, we'll do that. Look, it's only three sides. We should finish that up pretty quickly. And then, um, uh, then it's just going to be studying for the exam on Monday this time. So I'll put a conflict sign-up sheet. If you want to take the conflict, I'll put that up on Lawn Cap. It's not there yet. Your homework's not posted yet. I'll do that right after class. And then um, you know what to do. It's just going to be the same deal. You'll have this practice exam, another one online, one on Lawn Kappa. And um, I think that it's, uh, and we also have a whole day to do the review. So we'll just review this. We'll go over this exam here. So before next class, it would be a good idea to do this, the one in the book. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. So let's start. So last time what we were doing, remember we looked at, we've been looking at this example where we're predicting a zero, one variable whether or not these students uh, get into medical school. And we were basing it on uh, either one variable, and then the last thing we did was two variables. We were trying to predict uh, the probability if they get accepted based on their gender and their biological science school portion of the MCAT. So now, um, we really didn't do any hypothesis tests. All we did was fit a uh, log odds uh, regression equation. It was linear and log odds. We fit that and interpreted the log odds, the odds, and the probabilities from that, right? But now we're going to look at inference for logistic regression. And um, it's very similar to what we've done before. It's actually even easier in some sense because the uh, test that we're going to use is a chi-square test if it's multiple regression, and then a z-test on the individual slopes. All right? So uh, let's think about this. First thing, uh, the inference for logistic regression is almost exactly the same as it is for regular regression. So in both cases, what we do is we start with um, to test whether any of the slopes in the model are significant. So if you can have a, in general, the logistic regression model is of the form you have the log odds, and then it's linear here. You have an in intercept plus, then you can have multiple x variables predicting this log odds, which is the log of the probability of something over 1 minus the probability of that thing. All right? And now, as usual, for the overall test here, the uh, null is that all these slopes, not the intercept, but all these slopes in front of the x's, one of your predictor variables, in our model, in our model, are zero. In other words, this model is pretty much worthless. You might as well just predict the average of the log odds here, right? So uh, all the betas are zero, except for the intercept. And the alternative is, uh-uh, we have at least something here. At least one of those betas in the model is equal, is not equal to zero. OK? So um, that's what we're going to do. So in ordinary regression, remember we could choose either um, a chi-square test, or if the sample was small, we usually did an f-test, because the f-test would converge to the chi-square when the n was big enough. But here, in logistic regression, we're predicting counts, just counting things. It's like a binomial. We're just counting things. So we never use f-tests. Um, just like when we you know, predict, just like when we're dealing with percents, we don't use t-tests, right? The probability distribution, um, including the standard deviation, is determined directly from the predicted counts, as it is for a chi-square test. Right? That's unlike F or T tests, where you have to estimate a standard deviation from the variation, not from the predicted mean itself. 
if you know a count or if you know a mean for a percent problem, you know what percentage of the, that directly gives you um, the standard deviation. It's the mean and the standard deviation are tied when you have counts, right? If I thought 70, if I predicted 70% of the popular, of the, if my sample had 70%, that would give me, I'd estimate the population was 70%, but I'd also have an estimate that the um, standard deviation of the population was the square root of 0.7 times 0.3. So it's completely tied. We don't have a separate estimate. So we don't have to, um, so we don't, we don't need to use a T or an F distribution. We never do, in fact, it's wrong to. It doesn't follow a T or F. Okay, so, um, so our tests are gonna be uh, chi-square tests, which are like the sum of z-squareds, right? Um, or actually likelihood-based analogs of chi-squared. So they're not F or T-like at all. They don't depend on the sample size. They just depend, like a chi-square, on the number of parameters in the model, which is the number of x's in the model. The number of parameters in the model minus one. That's minus the intercept. So it's the number of x's, the number of slopes in front of those x's, right? Those are the number of parameters. That are, that's what the degrees of freedom are for a chi-square. So, all right? And um, so it doesn't have any n in the degrees of freedom. There's not going to be two sets of degrees of freedom, so it's very simple. It's just uh, the number of parameters in the model minus the intercept one, which is the same as the number of x's in this model. All right, now, um, and then um, in ordinary regression, when, once we find out that something is significant, the whole overall, uh, we have significance overall, the overall model has significance, then we can say at least one of the slopes is significant to test the individual slopes. Um, well, in ordinary regression, you can use either a Z or a T test, but not in logistic regression. You're only going to use a Z test for the same reason. We'll never use T tests, right? So we'll always use a Z test. Uh, a Z test could be the same as, you know, a Z squared is the same as chi squared with one degree of freedom, so you can do a chi squared test, too or a likelihood version of the Z, but you never use F or T test. So it's a lot easier. You don't have to deal with those pesky degrees of freedom. You know, it's just the number of parameters minus one for the chi-squared. It's very simple. All right, so, um, so now that you know that, the main difference between the ordinary and logistic regression is that we're not gonna be doing these least squares estimation. We're not trying to mint to get these parameters we're not minimizing the sum of the squared errors. Um, we're doing instead, so we're not, instead of minimizing the sum of the squared residuals, like the sum of squares for the errors, we're gonna estimating, estimate them by choosing the betas that maximize the likelihood of getting our sample data. So we're gonna be using these maximum likelihood estimates. So, um, and they're, in this case, they're different that we can't really do least squares here. Um, so we're gonna do something else. We're gonna, maximizing the likelihood is the same as minimizing something called the deviance, which is negative two times the log of the likelihood. If um, you're following along and taking the 390 course, um, there's <coughs> a lot more mathematical explanation and if you want to read that, it's very, it's very useful. You're not required to read that. But if you want to, you could read, if you want a more mathematical explanation here, you could just read lesson 13 on the lessons page. You all have access to it um, on the 390 site. So it would be, uh, Lessons page um, of our 390. Just click on the 390 and then click on lessons page. You probably noticed there's a tab for 390 on our stat 200. If you go, go dot, if we go here, I'll show you. If we just go to here, you go here, and then there's a lessons page right here. And then you can go to lesson 13. 
can go right here. Maximum likelihood. You can read that. And it's very, it's very, it's pretty simple. So if you want to do that, feel free. That's a good explanation. And it goes, this goes along with our class, by the way. It goes along with what we're doing in class here. All right. So now, um, <clears throat> so let's go back to the document camera here. And um, so, uh, so we're going to look at these. Uh, so minimizing the deviance in logistic regression is analogous to minimizing the sum of squared errors in ordinary regression. It plays the same role. And you can even, we're going to look at something called an analysis of deviance table, and we're going to look at its similarity to the ANOVA table. All right. Um, so as we said before, as I mentioned before, we can look at it more carefully now. Why are we doing this likelihood procedure? Well, think about it. If you had a continuous predictor variable, like let's say uh, if MCAT scores was continuous, it's not. But let's say you thought height was a predictor. You were using height as a predictor. Now that's a continuous variable, right? Then each individual uh, point has its own x value, right? And so there aren't a bunch of x's. Like when, when I, sh you know, there aren't a, like there are a bunch of people who scored 12. So we can take the average of those. But let's say it wasn't that way. Let's just say there's just, there's individual x's. That means that each point results, the y variable is either 0 or 1. For every, every point, it's either 0 or 1. It's, it's not like, uh, you know, 75% of the people got accepted in a little category. No, you have an individual 0 or 1 for every single x. So what does that mean in terms of the log odds? That means you either have the log of the probability over 1 minus the probability. So you either have the log of 0, right here, 0 over 1, or 1 over 0. So that means either negative infinity or positive infinity. So what is it? So minimizing the squared error for the predicted log odds and fitting a bunch of infinities is not going to work. What does it even mean? So what you have to do is you'd have to choose intervals. But then your, your uh, parameters are going to depend on the particular intervals that you choose. I mean, you could just say, OK, we're going to minimize the observed minus the predicted, all right, where each observed is 0 or 1. But and it, it, let's say you did that anyways. But that wouldn't, the problem with that is it does an OK job of fitting near the middle. But it wouldn't be sensitive to whether the prediction gave realistic odds for rare events. Like, do you see how, like, once you square this, 1 minus 0 0.01 squared is hardly different than 1 minus 0. Point you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 squared. But you're much, much more likely to get a 1 here for 0 0.01 than you are for 0 0.00001. So, and maximum likelihood is sensitive to that, is sensitive to that, to the rare events. It's sensitive throughout the entire data. So it's much, much better to do that. That's sort of the, my attempt to, um, explain it intuitively and why you would do this. If you want the more exact, if you want like more of a mathematical approach, this is pretty mathematical, but it's in words. So if you, you could read the other one. OK? So that's the idea. Now, all right, so let's look. Now, we, this is the, what we got. This is the same fit we got before. Remember, we, had, we got this log odds equation with these slopes right here. Here it is, the log odds is equal to, here's your beta naught right here, the intercept, right? Here's the, here's the equation we're looking at right here. We got this through the uh, least squares, and here's um, beta 1 and beta 2, all right? And um, so here's this, we can look at this. Here's the chi-squared. Here's um, this analysis of deviance table. And so, for example, this R, so you have a model, you have an error, and you have this total. Um, and this R squared is what? This is going to be 29.33 over the total, 
75.79, and this R squared is not your, this is called, you're not going to be tested on this, but just so you recognize it, if you get, if you're looking at some software, this is called the McFadden's R squared. I'm just trying to match things up here, and so here's this is sort of an adjusted chi-squared here. So you can say what it's not quite a chi-squared, but it's very, very similar. And the degrees of freedom here are the number of parameters in the model minus the intercept. So that's where the 2 is coming from. It's the number of x's, the degrees of freedom, the number of parameters in the model minus the intercept. And um, so what is the usual so we're not going to do an f-test. We do this um, sort of an, we do this chi-square test, and the null would be what? The null would be, it, it's our usual null, that what? Both the slopes in our model, this is what we got in our, um, this is our fitted model. This is our predicted right here. But in the ideal model, right? Of course we see, so, we see these slopes right here. But the idea is that they're just due to chance variation. And really, if we did it you know, over and over again, if we looked at everybody, these wouldn't be predictors at all. Gender and biological science would just be equal to zero. So all the betas, and here there's only two, all the you know, betas in the model, the capital, the Greek letter betas, are equal to, both betas are equal to zero. And the alternative, as usual, is uh-uh, at least one of them is not zero. All right, and then what are we going to do? We're just going to do our usual, and just to refresh your memory, what are we going to do? We're going to compare the chi-square stat that's given to you, which is right here. So we're going to compare our chi-square statistic that we see on this printout of 29.33 to, um, well, we could look it up, or if you just had a table, like on your exam, we'd have to compare it to some critical value. So we'd have to compare it to the critical value of chi-squared at what degrees, so we'll put a star for critical, and at what degrees of freedom do we want to put in there? The degrees of freedom are two. So the degrees of freedom are going to be equal to the number of parameters minus one, which in this case is three minus one, which is two. Sorry. So we'd have to compare it to that at some significance level. So look at this chi-square we got, 0.005%. That's tiny. Less than that. Less than that. So we're going to, let's see what our, let's look at our table at the back and see what um, we have. And then we can look online as well. So here's our chi-square table. So we're just looking at this degrees of freedom 2. And the smallest p-value here is 0.1%. OK, or that's the same as alpha equals 0 0.0, like that. That's alpha that's for that. All right, so that's 13.82. So that's 0.1%. My goodness, that's really tiny. And that's as far as we go. So basically, what it's going to 13.82. So we'll say at alpha equals 0 0.001, which is the same thing as at 0.1%, is equal to what? 13.82. That's our critical value, and we're comparing that to it. Well, that's much, much bigger. Like if we drew the picture, what would it look like? Remember, chi-square is always positive, right? It's squared. And do you know, and so it's going to, at just two degrees of freedom, it's going to look something like this, and it's going to get really, it never crosses, but it gets tiny, tiny, tiny. And the mean, as you remember, of the chi-square distribution is equal to its degrees of freedom. So the mean would be about two. Um, We'd have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 
11, 12, 13, 14. And right here at 13.82, the area here, which you can barely see, I'm just highlighting it, is just equal to what? From here on in, P is what? P is equal to 0.1% from here. That's just 0.1%. And what do we have? Our chi-square is 29.33. It's way, way, way out here. So our chi-squared, our p-value is to the right of here. And that's where this 0.1% is. No, that's 0.1%. This is almost 0%, right? Look, if this whole thing is 0.1% from our chi-squared, this is our chi-square stat, and this is the critical value, that's 0.1%. So I'd say this is almost, our p-value is what? Almost 0, would you say? Certainly less than that. I'd say it's almost 0. P is approximately 0%. Why don't we look online and see exactly what it is? We can see what this picture looks like better. So let's go back here. And now we can go to, um, to OK, so let's go to our p-value calculator, and let's go to the chi-square. And we have two degrees of freedom. And our chi-squared is huge. It's 29.33. Um, and so we want to compute the p-value. Yeah, it's very, very small here. So this is what it looks like. And our chi-square is out of the plotting range. They can't even plot it. So it's um, very small. As you can see, it's close to zero. Now, if I did do two, that should be the mean. So we should, let's see. So compute the p-value. Now, it's not 50% because it's not a symmetrical distribution. This is the mean. And remember, the mean is it's a long right-hand tail. So the mean is going to be to the right of the median. The median would be the 50% mark. I mean, if you had 20 degrees of freedom, eventually this is going to look pretty normal, right? So if you had something like 20 degrees of freedom, then it will be closer. The mean and the median will be much closer. So now it should be, yeah, much closer to 50%. So uh, that's the idea here. Any questions on this? All right, so let's go back to, um, now there is no left-hand tail that we're compute. That would be, this left-hand tail is, remember the null is, that all the betas are zero. And if they were, then we, if our sample data actually gave us that, it would just be, what is this left-hand tail? It's very unlikely that we would, there's going to be some variation, right? So it's mostly used to test whether people are faking their data and making it more perfect than it is. So we, we hardly ever use the left-hand tail for a chi-square. Either use the, use the right tail, just about always. OK, now, um, any questions on that? So let's go back to our document camera. And um, did we come up with a conclusion? Yes, we have to, uh, let's see, it, it, yes, our, it, we agree with this p-value here of uh, right here. And here it gave a more, to more decimal places. Yeah, it agrees with that. Um, and we reject the null. and conclude what? That at least one of the slopes is not zero. That means either the gender slope or the biological science slope. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Reject and null and conclude at least one of the slopes, either the gender slope or the biological science slope, is, has something to it, is not equal to zero. So now, um, to test whether the individual slopes are significant, we're going to do these z-tests. So it's very familiar, easy. You don't have to worry about degrees of freedom here at all. 
So what would we could do the gender slope first. We could say what would be our our null is that the gender um, the null is one of them say not equal to zero. Let's see if it's the gender or the um, it could be both. Okay, it looks like it's both. We can look right up here. It looks like the biological science is even more significant. But let's just do it and make sure it agrees. What we do agrees and think about it. So for the bio, for the gender. Um, we can say the slope for gender, the null is that it's equal to zero, and the alternative is what? That it's not equal to zero. You know, in our, in our model. Of course, in our sample, we got a non-zero slope. We just want to know if that's due to chance or not. If that's sm so small it's due to chance or whether it's big enough to be real. Okay, so we have that. And now we have to compute a z-score. So our z is always what? Our observed slope, the <coughs> right there, our observed slope minus the expected under the null, which is 0, over the standard error. So this is, we're just checking what, what's already given to us. That's all we're doing. So we're saying 2.015 minus 0 over 0 0.8 five, seven, nine, and we're just checking if that's correct, and it is, two points within rounding area, yeah. Okay? So that's our Z. So that's how we got that, and then um, now we have to think, let's go wide. They actually gave us here two-sided p-values here. For a, they're doing a two-sided test. That's just the printouts yeah. usually give you that. But does that make sense? I think for gender it would make sense. You really don't know whether males or females are going to be discriminated against. If there is a um, favoritism, you don't know if it's going to be towards males or females. I originally thought it would probably be towards males, and it turned out to be towards females. I mean, sure, if we did it over again, we might want to do a one-sided one, because you wouldn't need as, as much uh, of a evidence to reject the null. It's easier to show significance if you have evidence already. But let's pretend this is our first time going through it, and we really don't know. Yeah? Um, how did I know? You wouldn't know unless you actually, I just know that this, this program was giving me two sides. It had, I just, they're going to both be the same, and I knew they were two-sided because I've, you'll see. Pretend, you don't know really yet. But we're going to calculate, and we'll see. You don't know, and we're going to calculate, and you'll see it is. All right. So, but what I'm saying is if we were really doing this, we're doing a two-sided test here. We decided to do one. If we weren't doing a two-sided test, what would this be? It would be saying it either favors males or females. So it'd be greater than or equal to less than, right? Okay. In this case, I should say gender is coded as what? Gender is coded as one for, uh, females, right? One for females, so it would be greater than if we thought females were favored. All right, so now uh, what do we want to do? So we would just um, figure out the p-value. You just draw a normal curve. And um, zeros in the middle, and we'd look up 2.348. So pretend this was an exam and you didn't have anything but the back of the book. So we'd look up 2.348, and um, you could round to 2.35, 98.12. All right, so that's 98.12% in the middle between um, 2. 2.348 and negative 2.348, and the p-value is going to be the probability that our slope, let's say under the null, we'd expect right here. We'd expect, this is as a z-score, as a slope, just remember what we're doing here. As a slope, we'd expect 0, and then our standard error is not quite 1, so this is where our sample actually landed at a slope of 2.015. It 
matches up with that. Yeah. All right? And so the, this is the probability that we'd see this big a slope in this direction, or negative, that direction. This together is the probability of doing that if the null was true, and if it, it looks like it's really small, what is it? The probability of the p-value is 100 minus 98.12% over 2, which is equal to 1.88%. And that agrees with the 1. That's how I knew. It would be half of that if it was um, a one-sided test, right? Right? Does, does everybody understand that? That's one point. Oh, yeah, that's what I mean. That's without, that's one point. Oh, so they did one-sided. No, this is one point. Yeah, it's 1.88 without dividing by 2. No wonder you're all looking so strangely at me. Sorry, of course, it's without dividing by 2. Why would I divide by 2? I would divide by two if it was if, I, if it was one-sided. I'm sorry. I want both of those. I want 100% minus the middle. Both of those is 1.88. I just automatically divided by two for some reason. Sorry. That's without dividing by two. Any other questions about that? So yes. How do I know when to do a one-sided or two-sided? Why don't we look at the next one, and that will help you. It's a very good question. How do you know when? The, first of all, it's not a big deal. A lot of times people do these two-sided just to be conservative. Because if you get significance with a two-sided, you're definitely going to get it with a one-sided. Because you're going to get half the p-value with a, with a, you know, a one-sided. So a lot of times people just do this to be conservative. But it makes sense to me because I didn't know which direction it would go in. But let's look at the next one where I think I would do a two-sided. And the next one, so what do we conclude here? We're going to reject the null and conclude what? That gender is significant. That females, so far it looks like females, at least in this model, are being favored and men are being discriminated against. Why? Because we coded females as one. All right. It looks like, but, you know, it's two-sided here, so we didn't. All right, so let's look at the next one. We're concluding that it's just not equal to zero, but even if we did. All right, let's look at the next one. So let's, you'll see, you'll understand it much better. So let's look at the next one is uh, for biological science score is equal to zero. And the alternative here, what do you think I should do? That the beta for biological, do you really think that it's just as likely that a lower biological science score is going to help you get into med school as a higher one? We think it's significant, but we're not sure whether it's good to really bomb your test and do terrible rather than do well. Do you, think, do you think that makes sense? I mean, that's insane. We know something about it, so let's use what we know. And that's why we'd say it's greater than. We're testing whether it's significant, meaning that it's greater than zero. I mean, why would you ever say that it's just, you know, yeah, we just think it's different. We don't know which direction it would go in. Even if the program does it, you don't want to do it. Right? Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? So in this case, of course you're going to say this because we know that as your biological science score goes up, the probability of being accepted is going to go up. And it would be silly for us to not use that information. So that why, so that even though the program will do the two-sided for everything, it seems stupid to do it in that in this case. So in this case, we'll do the same thing. We'll say z equals 1.66. I'm just looking up here. 1.66 divided by the standard error. And look at this huge z score. And now this is the two-sided, but we should divide it by 2. 
So we'll go 1.66 over 0 0.4629, and we get 3.586. And then if we drew this, we drew this, yeah, and then we draw this. Thank you so much. I wish it was, I wish I could write on a blackboard or a whiteboard. That's my favorite thing. I like to move around and do that, but here we go. Then you see the whole thing. All right, and so now we're doing the same thing. And now we're way out on the tails here, way out. And we got 3.586, but and be, we're still going to say between 3.586 and negative 3.586, we'll get a middle area. And I got 99.966%. But now we know this is the p-value because we knew it was going to go in this direction. It was this, the, we're going to have a positive slope. So we're in here, it's one-sided, and we'd say, here we would divide by 2. So we'd say the probability is equal to 100% minus 99.966%, and there we'd divide by 2. I mean, it's, kind of, it's so tiny in either, in either case. But when I did this, I got 0 0.017%. So it was basically with, there's some rounding here, it was half of that. 0 0.015 would be half of that, but there's some rounding going on. So, all right, so that's what I got. And um, so we reject the note. This looks extraordinarily significant. There's overwhelming evidence that biologicals, it's a high, that, yeah, that there's a positive slope here. Well, duh. But we're just, I'm just showing you how it works. So, of course, reject null overwhelming evidence. Overwhelming evidence that this is significant, that this slope is significant, that beta for the biological is greater than zero. Not only is it significant, but here we can say the direction. Reject null and say that gender is significant, we just say it's not equal to zero. But here we can say that it's greater than zero. Does that make sense? If we did this again, I'm really curious in this, about this. I wonder if there is discrimination in favor of females for medical school. That would be very strange. That would be interesting. And then um, the next time we, we could test that and put a greater than sign here. Okay. It's possible we just, you know, they're, they do better at interviews or something else or some other factor we're ignoring that they do much better at so that if we control for that, it would go away. All right, so that's any questions on this. It's the same as what we've been doing all along. Now we're just going to look at confidence intervals. And then um, we should, now that we're here, though, we could look at, do you want to look at it on the uh, computer? You don't really need to, but do you want to uh, look at uh, the normal distribution? We could, and just check that out. What did we have? 3.586, so we do 3.586, and then we're going to compute, we're just going to look at the right-hand tail, compute the p-value, and we get something very close to what we got. Yeah, it's zero, what did we get? 0.0. .0 one seven percent. That's exactly this. And there it is. And if we did two sided we get <coughs> they just didn't give all the significant digits here. They just that they cut it off here in our program. Any questions on that? All right. And our other one, we could check our other one was what? Um, our other one was 2.348. We could do that one, 2.348. And there we did do the two-sided. And um, that's what we got, 0 0.188.
So uh, let's go back to the document camera now. And we just have a little bit more left to do, and then we're done. So we're going to get out early. And uh, I'll put the homework up. And if you have any questions, just see me right afterwards. And you, now you can start looking at practice tests and studying. OK, so here we have this log odds equation that we just looked at before, right? And now we can build confidence intervals the usual way. All right? Um, so here's the confidence intervals right here. So how did they get these? They took, for example, this is for the log odds equation. So for the log odds, these confidence intervals, if you notice right here, don't contain zero. So that's equivalent. These are 95% confidence intervals. So that's, this would be a good exam question. See if you can fill it in. See if you'd get it right. What do you think that's going to be? Trying to make it clearer here. I'll draw the picture for you. So it's based on this normal curve here, right? And this plus or minus 1.96. We usually round to 2, but here we're going to do 1.96. Be a little more exact. So this is between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. Zeros in the middle is 95%. So that leaves on this side and this side leaves 2.5% and 2.5%. So if it doesn't contain 0, that means that when we go add, 1.96, or if we were landed here and subtracted 1.96 times the standard error, once we change it to a z-score, it looks like this, because the standard error is 1. And then it looks like um, if it doesn't contain 0, that means it had to be in this part or this part, which is equivalent to what? A two-sided test giving a p-value less than. It has to be here or less less than what? Has to be over here, which would be less than 2.5, and over here, which is less than 2.5, so together it has to be less than 5%. So we've done that before, a lot of times talked about that, right? Okay, now to build confidence intervals for the odds ratio, you have to follow the two-step process. These are confidence intervals for what? For the log odds. This equation right here is for the log odds, right? That's what this is. And that's what we're building confidence intervals for these in the log odds. That's the two. This is a confidence that it's saying that that doesn't contain zero. That's what our estimates are. But now if we want to change it to odds for the odds ratio that's e to the for, for the odds ratio the odds ratio for gender is what e to that slope e to the 2 right whatever that is and that is approximately 7.5 so now we want to build confidence intervals around that and we can't just say okay we're going to take um, 1.96 you can't just raise, you have to, remember you have to do it in two steps. So let's go ahead and do it. So find the endpoints of the confidence interval for the slope first. We've done this before. We're, and then we're going to exponentiate each endpoint. What it looks like. And we're going to do that. And that, as you can see probably, will give us the geometric mean, not the, um, not the arithmetic mean. We're going to get those asymmetrical confidence intervals. So let's do it. So here, the first step is find the end. Okay, so a 95% confidence interval for the slope is just what we have here. Do We can do it for gender. It's just going to be 2.5. 0, 1, 5. What are they doing? Plus or minus? We're going to use a z-score of 1.96 times the standard error. And 
that's how they got this right here, okay? They just added and subtracted basically two of those. So two minus that get, gives you 0 0.33. one all the way up to 3.696. All right, so that's the usual, right? And so then what are we going to do for the odds ratio? For the odds ratio, the 95% confidence interval, not for the slope, but for e to the slope, for the odds ratio, it's just e to that, right? E raised to all that. That's what I did here, e raised to that. So e raised to this endpoint, so that's e to the 0 0.331 to e to the 3.696. And then I got 1.4 to 40.29. And then you can check that it's the, that the odds ratio that this that if you take the square root, check that the square root of 1.4 times 40.29 is equal to 7.5, about, within rounding error. I mean, if you wanted to do it exactly, you can see, um, look, if you multiply these two together, right, what, we're, what are we doing here? We're checking, if you want to sh the check, it's pretty clear that what are you doing here? So you're checking that the square root of um, e to the sample slope minus 1.96 times e to the sample slope plus. E. So we have e to the sample slope, e to the slope minus, it's in the exponent here, so that's times e to the negative 1.96 times the standard error. That's this one. And then you're going to multiply it times e to the slope plus in the exponent, which is times e to the 1.96 times the standard error. And so these will just be e to the 0, which is 1. So you have the square root of e to the slope times e to the slope, which is e to the slope. So it's the geometric mean. That's all we're checking. All right, so that's why we get these asymmetrical confidence intervals here that it's not in the center. It's not the average of those two. It's the average of the exponents, the exponents. All right, so now this means that we're 95% sure that the eyes for females getting into this, into in this model are what? Between 1.4 times to 40.29 times greater. That's a huge range than the odds of males getting in. But look, skip down to this one. An odds ratio, the odds ratio confidence interval not containing what? Is equivalent to the slope confidence intervals not containing zero. See, our slope didn't contain zero, right? So that means that when you do the odds, it's not going to contain what? The female's going to have greater, when the slope doesn't contain zero, it means they're favoring females. So in terms of odds, the female's odds are going to be greater than one, right? So you, you can see that. It's going to be greater than one. If this was less than, if this contained zero, then this would be a negative and would be less than one. All right? You know that. So the, you know, 50-50 probability means what? That the odds are one to one, and that means the log odds are zero. So when we're, we're in the log odds, so if it doesn't contain zero, that means the odds don't contain one, and that means there's not a 50-50 chance probability between males and females getting in. So that's, uh, we can do the same thing here. We can, let's do it quicker now for the, for odds ratio for um, the biological science. Our first thing is the 95% that 
Let's just do it ease quicker. 95% confidence interval for the slope for the biological science. So what is that? Let's just, you know, we just added 1.96 times that, right? We're doing the same thing. 1.6 is plus basically two, plus and minus two of those. So we got that. So we have that right there. So once you get that, there's your confidence interval. If that's given to you, then all you need to do to get the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio is exponentiate it. So that's all we're doing. It's pretty easy. We've done it a bunch of times before. And I did that and I got approximately 212 to 13.03. Okay, so that means we're 95% sure that the odds of getting to med school on this, based on this data, are between 2.12 to 13.03 times greater for each extra biological science score. And you could check it the same way, that the geometric mean of this is what? Is e to the slope, you could say the square root of 2.12 times 13.03. You want to check that that is what? Equal to e to um, the 1.66. All right. Um, any, yeah, I'm sorry. You can include zero in the interval here. Oh, you mean in um, the odds interval? That would mean negative odds, no. And odds have to be positive. So yeah, so in the log odds, no. It can be less than one, but odds is P over one minus P, and those are both positive, so odds have to be positive. But 50-50 odds is, is what we're testing, like whether we're trying to see if um, if it makes a difference to go like one. Does it is it does it uh, is it better or worse basically to go? If we got a, a zero slope, that means the odds of when you went up one point really didn't in your biological science score it didn't affect anything or down one point. <clears throat> if we got negative in the log odds, that would mean that it would be uh, less than one odds, which means your probability would be less than one minus the probability. It would be better to be, if we got a negative here, that would mean that going, the worse you do on your biological science score, the better you, <laughs> your odds of getting in. All right, so let's, uh, any other questions on um, this and um, so this summary is really uh, useful, and you should read this on your own. And um, you have a lot, just start studying, and I'll post the homework right now. If you have any questions, you can see me right afterwards.